It's not about the nail. This is what I want to talk about tonight. As funny as it is, and as ridiculous as that woman is. <laughs> this isn't a marriage seminar, so that's as far as I'm going on that. I want us to look at ourselves and I want us to think about where we are exactly the way that she was portrayed. Where we have things in our life that have been with us for so long that it is no longer an intruder. That it has, it has been affecting us for so long that we don't even look to it as this could possibly even be the problem. But as we have been going after God and as we have been seeking after God, we have found out that God is not withholding revival from us. He is not withholding His Spirit from us. In fact, He did everything that He needed to do when Jesus hung on the cross to get all of heaven down to us. That we are in fact the ones that are not taking hold of what has already been provided. And as she said, she said, I can't understand why all my sweaters are snagged <laughs> and her husband looked at her like she was crazy and so many times we are going God I don't understand why you are so far away yet we will open the word and we will read something that says you have a nail stuck in your head and we'll go I just don't know what it is <laughs> I don't know what it could possibly, I don't know what could possibly be. We come to the scripture and it's like stop lying and we keep getting into trouble because we keep telling lies and we're like, I just, uh, I don't know why I'm always getting into trouble. You know, I just don't know why my friendships keep falling apart. Because you're a liar and you don't want to recognize that you have a nail stuck in your head. And this is what we want to talk about. This is where we want to come last week. We asked God, do these pants make us look fat? And he replied, it's not the pants. <laughs> and when we can come before God and we can be honest and we can ask the real questions and the hard questions, the next step is to actually be willing to have the reply. Tell me the truth. Because once I hear the truth, I know what is happening, I know what is wrong, I know what needs to be done. But here's the big thing. To hear truth and not to act upon truth is a complete waste of time. If I got the world's greatest athletics coach, the world's greatest running coach, and he was speaking to me and he was telling me what I needed to do to, to run better, to run faster, and I was hearing all the information that he was telling me, and he was giving me information that had led to many people winning gold medals at the Olympics. And he was giving me information that had produced the fastest men and women on the planet. But if I never did anything with what he was telling me, it would profit me nothing. Tonight, I'm not going to have you look up all the scriptures because I want to move fast because we are going to do something beautiful at the end of tonight and we are going to do exactly what the scripture says and that's for us to come in prayer. You see, because we can hear about revival and we can read the scripture, but if we never do anything about it, nothing's ever going to change. I can go to every marriage seminar on the planet and the best people can be speaking, but if I won't take that and apply it to my marriage, my marriage will remain exactly the same. And if we keep talking about revival and we keep learning about revival and we learn exactly what stops revival, what brings revival, and we do nothing, we will stay exactly the same place that we are, except with more knowledge, which will lead to more frustration, more hunger without any filling. And that's not where we want to be. Second Chronicles 7.14, as we have been going through this slowly tonight, we get to the next part. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, we have been learning about humbling ourselves, about coming to God and saying, you know what, I don't have it all together, I need you. Seek my face, and he asks for tonight's part. Turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. You see, revival and healing are the same thing. 
Because all healing is, is a restoration back to a condition that somebody was supposed to be. Do you, do you know that? If a marriage is revived, all that happens is it is restored back to the condition that it should have been in the first place. Do you know that all God has been trying to do since He sent Jesus is put us back to the position that He intended for us right from the beginning when we can walk and talk with God the way He did with Adam and Eve? This is what He's been trying to do. He's been trying to revive us, but revive us back to what our normal should be. But for us, revival is so out there. It's so, imagine just being so consumed with God's presence. Loving God so much that we hate sin and just want to seek Him and serve Him. That's what normal is supposed to be like. Just like a normal marriage is supposed to be in love and thinking of one another. You know, a lot of Waiheke Sneaky and all those other things that a normal marriage should have. But instead... Our normal in marriage is fighting, it's distant, it's no communication, it's barely hanging on. And this is where we find our Christian walks, but that's not normal. It's not normal for us to be distant from God. It's normal for us to be rushing into His presence to say, oh, I can't wait to be with you. To wake up in the morning and say, I think I slept too long because I miss you. Cracking up the Bible, not going, oh, let me get through my 10 or 5 or 1 chapter. But going, oh my goodness, Lord, I get to read your word. What do you have to say to me today? That is normal, the way it's supposed to be. And that's what revival is trying to do, is take us back to normal, take us back to the Garden of Eden where we can walk and talk with a God that we have such a close relationship with. But we've got some nails stuck in our head. Right? Anybody would already be honest to say, you know what, I think I've got some nails stuck in my head. God, would you show me what they were? Because there's always two responses. There's a response like that lady had and say, it's not the nail. Don't talk to me about the nail. <laughs> the other response is say, Lord, how do we get rid of this nail? Okay? Turn from their wicked ways. Now, obviously, I'm not speaking to anybody here. No one here has wicked ways. It's the person next to you. So turn to them and say, he's talking to you tonight. <laughs> if revival doesn't come out of desperation and it doesn't lead to my life changing, then all it was was an emotional outburst. We've all been emotionally moved by something only to return back the same way. We've all watched a movie. I watched that uh, movie, uh, Super Size Me, where the guy just ate McDonald's for 30 days. Who remembers that? It was so horrific. It was so traumatizing. We all swore that we would never eat another McDonald's again in our life. And a month later, I found myself with a Big Mac in my hands. But I was, I was moved. I was convinced I was not going back to Mickey D's, the Golden Arches. You would not find me in there again. But it was an emotional outburst. It wasn't out of desperation. It wasn't out of, Lord, something has to change. And so many times we come to church, we hear an emotional message. And there's nothing wrong with God working on emotions. We have them for a reason. We should be emotional people before God. But when it just stops there, that's when the problem is. Tonight we're going to see a movie of somebody who had more than just an emotional outburst. Who took steps to make sure things would change. So that revival could come. Turn from there. Wicked ways. Not just fall on our knees and ask for forgiveness. That's in there. But there has to be a point where we change our lifestyle. When we change our ways. When something has to be different than it was before. Without the changing of our ways, revival is never going to come. Because the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and thinking that something else is going to change. I am going to seek God and I'm going to go after Him like never before, but I'm not going to do a thing different in my life. Insanity. It's not going to happen. There has to be a change in our ways. Something has to change. How does that happen? James 1 verse 23 to 24, and those of you who are super fast, turn there. If you've got an iPad, iPhone, internet, turn there. Otherwise, just read it on the screen tonight. For if you listen to the word and do not obey it, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. 
you see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. Right? Who's ever looked in the mirror only to find that you had been with guests or been with people for hours and then you noticed that there was something really wrong with what you were seeing? I don't want to be crude, but this has happened to many people, but you had a big... Let me tell you a true story. That has happened to me while I was preaching. And then afterwards, I'm looking in a mirror and I'm like, oh my goodness. All these people have been watching the cliffhanger the whole time. I said to my wife, how could you do that to me? But if we come to God's word and we notice, man, I got some chocolate sauce on my face, my hair is standing up like this. And we see it and we go, and we do nothing about it. It's like somebody who looks in a mirror and just walks away. If we don't come to God's word and we don't come to Bible study and we don't go to church on the weekends with the attitude of, I want to clean up my face. We are absolutely wasting our time. I don't care how good the message is. I don't care how good the scriptures are. If we are not coming with a Q-tip and a cloth asking God to clean up something, to change something, to set us on a course, we're only fooling ourselves. That being in church is making any difference in our lives. We have to be coming with a heart. Lord, let's clean up some things, right? Maybe a waxing is in order. Maybe you've got to pull out the, the hedge clippers and get in there. Okay. <laughs> when I come with excuses why I can't change, the only thing I do is empower myself to remain in slavery to complacency. When I make excuses why I can't change, I just empower myself to stay in slavery to complacency. I can't seek after God. I just don't have enough time in the day. Then change your day. My job is just too demanding. Change your job. Is that crazy talk? Or is that talking about someone who's desperate to say, I'm going to go after God as much as I can. I'm not supporting people to just stay at home and not work. But you hear what I'm saying. People who are going to put God first have to change their ways to make a place for God to be available. If you never have time for God, you can never expect that revival is going to come. Because the scripture has laid out clearly, we're looking in the mirror and it says, we've got to humble ourselves, we've got to pray, we've got to seek God's face, and we've got to change our ways. And if we are not willing to change our ways, then don't expect that revival is coming. The question was asked, what are we going to do about what's happening with this land? What's happening with this country? The answer is right here. That he would come and heal our land. And the evidence is when Jonah goes to a city that is wicked, that is corrupt, that God is going to destroy, the message of God comes and God heals that land because they repent. God can do it again. But who's going to bring about the change? It's not the wicked people who are going to bring about the change, but they experience the benefit. What does it say, if? My people. Are there any my people here tonight? Amen. Sometimes we've done something the same way for so long that it just becomes the way we do it. A little boy was watching his mom cook a turkey one day, and he noticed that she would, she would cut the legs off and cut it into pieces and put it in a bowl and put it in the oven. And so, you know, intrigued by his mom's cooking, he asked her, why do you do this? And she said, well, to tell you the truth, it was just how my mother did it. So, you know, not satisfied with that answer, he called grandma. He said, grandma, why do you cut the turkey up like that, not just put it in the oven? She said, you know what? Uh, that's a good question. That's just the way my mother did it. Fortunately for this little boy, great-grandma was still alive and kicking, so he called her. And he said, greatest grandma, tell me, why do you cut the turkey like that and put it, and put it in the oven? And she said, um, because my oven was too small. <laughs> and how many things in our lives do we have that we just do because it was passed down to us, not because it's got anything to do with God, and we've picked up habits and lifestyles that we do. When if we actually took a look in the mirror and we were willing to look at the nail, we would say, you know what, this nail needs to come out. I'm tired of my sweaters getting snagged. 
something's got to change. Because a desperate person is willing to overturn all the rocks again to find out what they're missing and where they lost it. And they won't stop at any place to say, no, I've checked that. That's not a desperate person. A desperate person is on their knees till late in the night, lifting the couches, whatever it is, to find what it is they're looking for. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 to 21 says, Pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. What are prophecies? Divine insight and instruction from God. We find it in His Word. We find it in sermons. We find it through people. Don't despise it and don't quench the Holy Spirit. How do we quench the Holy Spirit? When He instructs us, when He leads us, when He guides us, when He shows us, when He speaks to us and we say, don't talk to me about the nail. Don't talk to me about the nail. It's not the nail. We quench Him. Do you know why? Because God can't say anything past what He's already said to us. Because that is the key to unlocking the next door. If you're not willing to fulfill the first part of the verse, you can never experience the last part of the verse. If we will not repent and come before Him and get desperate and hungry, we will never see the healing of our land. Where have I quenched the Holy Spirit in my life where He has been trying to show me and speak to me? And because of my culture, because of my denomination, because of my upbringing, I have said, no, I'm not even willing to look at that. Why? Because that's the way we've always done it. Only to find out the way it was done like that before wasn't even a very good reason for why I'm doing it like that now. Can we talk about some cultural nails? Now, if you came to South Africa, I would like to hear you say exactly what I'm about to say now. I'm just speaking it as an observer. Don't get upset with me, okay? I taught the message on don't get offended. <laughs> this is the time to apply it. But we were coming to America for a long time. From when I was in primary school, we loved coming to America on vacation. And we noticed there was this thing called Halloween. It was the greatest thing I had ever seen because you got free candy <laughs> and kids would dress up as superheroes and all of these things and you go from door to door and the first year I came it was amazing I was like man we, we have to have that because nobody's giving free candy in South Africa nobody <laughs> and in fact you can't get through the electric fencing and the gates to even try get candy so it's just not happening and then as I noticed as we would come back and back I saw this thing called Halloween become more and more disgusting is, is the only way that I can describe it. And I would notice that, that the, the, the movies that were on TV were horrific. Were horrific. It was, it was, it was demons and death and murder and, and all these psychopaths and all of that. And I was like, I'm not sure what everybody's getting so excited about. And then I noticed as, as kids stop dressing up as little superheroes and they start dressing up as, as, as ghosts and ghouls and, and all of that. And it really worried me what was going on? And then I approached somebody in a church, and, and I'm not trying to start any fights, I'm just stating something, this is my opinion. And I said, what's up with this Halloween thing? <laughs> and I said, whoa, don't, don't talk about the nail, my goodness. Don't talk about the nail, but the question that I want to ask you is, is this really what God would want? Is this really, or is this a nail that is sticking? What is this truly communicating? Because we are about to read a scripture that says pretty much the opposite of Halloween, but it doesn't stop at Halloween. There are many other things. Here's something that might not be as in your face. How about sports? How about sports? I sat in church on Saturday night when Dr. Young was speaking, and let me tell you what. I wasn't sure if the rapture had happened. I had to look behind me to make sure people were still sitting there. And it wasn't because of his preaching. Man, he was on fire. He was giving it all that he had. But it was like... And then those same people go to a football game and they become absolute wild animals. They're wearing bras and hats and just going crazy. And then they come into the house of God...
Is it possible that we are worshipping sports? And how do we know that we are worshipping sports? When something has our passion, when something has our heart, when we will put things aside, when we will travel miles in order to be part of something, but it's just, it's part of the culture, so it's just become acceptable. How about colleges? I've seen people more dedicated and excited about their colleges than their own children and wives. But because it's culturally acceptable, because you get a big ring, you know, well, that's just, that's just what we do. Don't talk to me about my nail. It's not about my nail. Are we willing to talk about the nail? And are we willing to take our cultural things and lay it down upon God's word to say, is this right? South Africa is one of the most materialistic places you can imagine. If, if you're not wearing a great watch, clothes, socks, I mean, people even look for the little emblem on your socks to make sure that you are cool, that you are wearing the best. But just because if that's what our culture produced, are we willing to look at the nail? Because you know what, Lord, I don't want anything in my life that's not of you that's holding me back. Are we willing to look at the things while we, we're cooking the turkey the way that we are cooking it? Because just because that's our culture, that doesn't make it right. We see men and women of God who stood up against the culture to follow God and His culture. We are aliens here. We are not residents here. We have been brought from another place so that we can make a difference here, so that we can bring heaven to earth and not be overwhelmed by earth, but to make a difference here. And until we are different, how can we make a difference? Right? Kids, I have seen the worship of children. The child takes precedence over everything else and our culture has taught us that's what it means to be a good parent. The day my child takes the place of God, the day I miss being in God's house for my child, my child has become my God and my child is now running my life. But because it's culturally acceptable and if you're not at every sporting event, your child is going to grow up messed up and they're going to hate you. My mother wasn't at all my sporting events. My father never came to one sporting event. I'm okay. <laughs> and then when you combine kids and sports, oh my goodness. Then you have a huge idol, but because everybody's doing it, because it's culturally acceptable, we just go along with the flow. But until somebody's willing to stand up and to teach our children that God is number one. When I was growing up, there was uh, the New Zealand rugby team, which has always been one of the best in the world. The World Cup was going to be played on a Sunday. And one of the best players on the team refused to play because Sunday was the day that he gave to God. That's been washed away. Now you silly. Why would you miss an opportunity? And we have all these excuses. Yes, but if you play, you can witness to the other players. If we are overriding our convictions, we have nothing to witness about. When we are laying all those things down, when we are coming up with excuses why we can't serve God fully, we will never see revival. We will remain complacent at the place where we are. Until we are willing to change our ways, we are never going to see something different. Am I right? Philippians 4 verse 8 says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Do you know what? My movie selection changed dramatically because of that verse alone. Because I was willing to come in and go, you know what, I am over 18 now. A lot over 18. You know, I think I can handle watching this movie. It's got nothing to do with age restriction. It's got to do everything with, Lord, what would you have and how do I think upon these things? This is how we are to be training up and raising up, not by culturally good standards, but by God's standards. Because God's plan will always lead to God's promises. In Mark 4.19 it says, But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire of other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. If I was sending you into a hostile environment, then I said, listen to me. Don't drink the water. 
Okay? The water, you're not, you, the water's not good for you. Has anyone here ever been to India? Somebody didn't tell me don't drink the water. It's a great dietary place to go. If you want to lose weight, go to India and drink the water. But if I was sending you to a hostile environment, I said, please remember that everything there is trying to kill you. Okay? Watch out for the plants because they want to take you down. Watch out for the animals. They want to bite you. Don't drink the water. You would be on your guard all the time. Do you realize this is the world that we are living in? Just like the world wants you to kill Jesus, this world wants to kill the Jesus that is inside of you. It wants to kill your passion. It wants to kill your dedication. And it makes, wants to make you gray and just blend in with everybody else. When we are aware that every single day we are going out, the TV ads, the, the everything... It's just trying to make you distracted and complacent and make sure that revival never comes because if revival comes, the land will be healed. And then we realize how many lies we have been fed and how our whole culture is trying to take us the other way, how it's trying to choke the word out of us that we are hearing. Because we can pack this place every week. We can pack our churches. In fact, we can even pack a stadium. But if we are not willing to change our ways, it will profit us nothing. Where are we when it comes to looking in the mirror of God's word? Are we willing to get on our knees and say, God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know how you're going to pull this nail out. Oh my goodness. Okay, okay, let go. That's really going to hurt. Some of us are in relationships that we should not be in. But because we've got this nail in our head, and it would be too painful to pull out. We just live with it and we just go with it. Some of us have addictions that we've just lived with because we, it was too painful to pull this nail out. But as long as we have this nail sticking in us, it is harming our soul. It is harming our walk with God and it is affecting every area of our life. This achy that she couldn't figure out what it was. It was affecting everything in her life. Can we pull the nail out tonight? Can we at least recognize that there is a nail? Can we at least come to God and say, God, I have not been living the way that you have intended for me to live because my normal is far from your normal. And Jesus, what you died for is not what I'm living. It's not what I have accepted. I have become a cultural Christian that is just bland and plain and not making any difference in this world. Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Second Kings 5, if you want to turn there, we can read this one together. Second Kings 5. In a documentary that I recently watched, a guy was trying to get people to make better food choices and he was speaking to a guy who was just eating all the wrong food choices and he said, this food is killing you. Stop eating this. To which the guy replied, well, this is what we've always eat in my family. Right? Is that what we want to pass on? Let me tell you something scary, something I read in a book once. What I cannot conquer, what I cannot defeat, my children will have to fight. And how many of us are having to deal with nails that are in our head because the generation before us were not willing to pay the price to pull it out. So we are having to fight for it now. Don't pass it on to the next generation. Joshua was able to go beyond what Moses could because Moses passed him something good. What are we passing down? Are we passing down a life that says that my Christian walk is dominated by sports? My Christian walk is dominated by school? My Christian walk is dominated by everything except God? 
I have not got to the stage where I'm having to enroll my kids in all these different sporting activities. And I know that we will face much pressure when we get told that your kids aren't going to have any friends and your kids are going to miss out on college, uh, on college scholarships and all of these things. And I love sport. I think it's a great thing for building teams. But when sport takes the place of God, sport must go down. It has to come off the table. We have to clear the stage so that God can have prominence once again because God is where everything is. And let me tell you what, at the end of our life, nobody cares what sports team you played for. When you get to the pearly gates and God says, why should I let you in? And you say, well, you know, I was a New York Jets player. You'd be like, woo! But I had so many fans. I had 24 million Twitter followers. Only what is done for Christ will last in this world. Only what is done for Christ makes a difference. And you can be a football star. And you can be all of these things. But the time that it starts to take away from God is the time to lay it on the altar. Because nothing is worth the place of God. Okay, let's go. Verse 1. Now Naaman was the commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given him victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. There was a problem. He had a big nail in his head. It was called leprosy. Now leprosy at that time was incurable. It could not be cured. So there was great distress that such a good man was going down. I want you to know that America is an amazing country. Who agrees? It's a phenomenal country. It's just like Naaman. It's valiant. It's brave. It has, it has given refuge to so many people. It has helped so many nations. But it's got some leprosy, right? But I want you to know, this story is a happy ending. No more Romeo and Juliet garbage, right? This is a happy ending. This is a happy ending. When the dead gets raised. Let's carry on. 5 verse 8 to 9. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, why did he tear his robes? Because there was no solution. There was no solution. And people saying there's no solution for America. Jesus has always been the solution. The Holy Spirit inside of you has always been the solution. Revival among the church has always been the solution. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Does that sound like a hard task? Sounds pretty simple, right? You know that some of the problems that we battle is our preconceived ideas on how it has to be. Our preconceived ideas on how God has to touch us and how God has to work. When I was 18 years old, I was struggling with thoughts in my mind of suicide and just depression and all of these things. And at the church, they had a call for people who were struggling with suicide to come down. As I told you, I grew up in a charismatic church. 50 people went down in front of 7,000 people at an auditorium. The pastor prayed, 49 of them fell down under the power of God, except one. It's me. I'm still standing. It was terrible. And then in my church, I had the walk of shame back, you know, because obviously, obviously there was sin in my life that God hadn't touched me. And I was tempted just to... And not to say that the other 49 weren't genuine, that's not what I'm saying at all. All I'm saying is I had a preconceived idea that if God was really going to touch me, this is what it was going to look like. But I want to tell you what, that God did touch me that day and He broke it that day. My thoughts changed that day. My heart was changed that day. Something was, was torn off me that day. Let's see how Naaman responded to just going and washing in the river. You see, whenever God gets ready to do something, He gives instructions on what to do. You never see God moving without Him giving instructions to His people for positioning themselves. Not once. 
So he wants to position him. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Are we willing to come to God and let Him pull the nail out the way that He says it needs to be pulled out or we want Him to do it the way that we think He should do it? How many times have we left in a rage because God didn't do it the way that we wanted to do it? We said, God, I want you to use me and so He used us and then we were angry because it wasn't the way that we wanted to be used. Right? I want you to send revival. Okay, get on your knees and repent. No! That's not what I'm talking about. I want, you know, just your presence to come and us to dance and sing until, you know, we all fall down. So, <laughs> Second Kings 5.13. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you some great thing, you would, have, would you not have done it? How much more when he tells you to go wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. As the man of God told him, and his flesh was restored and became like that of a young boy. God cannot lie. If God tells us something, he always delivers because to not deliver would be to deny himself. If we want revival, he's not withholding. He's just asking, will you do what I've asked? Will you position yourself because heaven is open and it's pouring down. And he's just saying, would you get in the place that I need you to get so I can give you what I've already paid for? Jesus already paid the price. We're not begging him for it. We just need to position ourselves in that place. Will we let God pull the nail out? Or will we hide behind our excuses and say it's not the nail? When it so obviously is. Will we look at the word with fresh eyes? Or will we hide behind culture and what our parents have done and our grandparents have done? What the country has declared. This is who we are as people and as Texans. As wonderful as Texas is. If Texas traditions go against God's word, it's time to change some traditions. Can I get an amen? amen. And I love Texas. That's why my accent is changing. <laughs> Daniel 1 verse 8 says this, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Daniel would not be bored out by the culture. Even though the culture said this is what you eat, this is what you drink. He said I don't want to do it. I won't do it. And because of a man who would not be changed by culture, does anybody know what happened? He changed the culture. Daniel changed the culture because culture could not change him. Because greater is he that is inside of you than he that is in the world. And when you will stand, God can use you. But when we fall down, he can't use us to bring about a change, to bring about revival. We are going to watch a short video. And we're going to hear a song, and I pray tonight that you let God penetrate your heart. Tonight, as I said, we're going to do something special. After this video and after the song, I'm going to speak for one minute on prayer. And then we are going to have people that are going to be on the sides, at the front. I want you to take this opportunity to say, Lord, do I have a nail in me? Do I have a nail in my heart? Lord, do you want to do something with me? If you are husband and wife and you want to pray together, pray together. If you need to pray with somebody else, you pray with somebody else. But there is power in prayer. Until we are willing to come to God and pray, sitting listening to a message is as good as it's going to get. Will you open up your heart tonight? Will you look into the mirror and say, Lord, okay, take it. Right? Pull. Pull.